Today's habit of the heart, we're, we're doing a habits of life that bring renewal into your life. That's our summer theme. And each Sunday in worship, we're thinking about those habits or values that we need to regularly apply that brings renewal. Today's habit is the habit of fresh eyes, or you could say clear, clean vision as to how we relate to one another. Um, uh, and, and, and so it begins with the reading of God's Word. Uh, John Calvin, the great theologian, um, uh, great-great-grandfather of the Presbyterian and Reformed Protestant tradition, John Calvin once referred to God's Word as the spectacles of Scripture that God gives us to put on so that we can see rightly. And so if you brought your Bibles... Uh, we also have the wall Bible. Let's put on God's glasses and look into his holy word. From 2 Corinthians chapter 5, we're going to pick up Paul's teaching at verse 16. So from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone. The new is here. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Gracious Lord, we thank you for this reading of your word. Please help us now, Holy Spirit. Help me with my words. Help us with our understanding. Lord, we want to hear your voice and to follow in faith. Amen. I think sometimes how we see is kind of humorous. Um, I've always enjoyed watching someone with brand new bifocals step up to a curb. It's a little bit like a drum major, right? Um, and you know, when it, comes to, when it comes to jokes about seeing, it just seems that they're getting cornea and cornea. I got that from Ken, okay. I once did a wedding for an optometrist and his bride, and in the ceremony, I asked the bride, do you take this man for better or worse? Okay, how about now, better or worse? But, okay. Paul is talking about regarding, seeing. Paul is helping us to have clear vision about how we see ourselves and others now in Christ. And I think that's because the Apostle Paul was being seen or viewed in some bad ways by some of the Christians in the city of Corinth, Greece. Some viewed him as all talk, no action. Some in Corinth viewed Paul as someone not to be trusted. Some viewed Paul as wondering whether he really was an apostle. Just before our reading in 2 Corinthians 5, I think Paul's temper comes out a little bit, and he makes mention of those in Corinth uh, who seem to put more emphasis on how they were seeing their appearance rather than on real internal character. But in our reading today, Paul takes this high view and he says, from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view, though we once regarded Christ 
this way, we do so no longer. You see the word regard there? It's about seeing. I like how this version puts it. Because of this decision, we don't evaluate people by what they have or how they look. We looked at the Messiah that way once and got it all wrong. We certainly don't look at him that way anymore. How are you looking at life, at Jesus, and one another? Friends, it matters. And it matters for the sake of spiritual renewal. And it has to do chiefly with how you see Jesus working in you. I'd like to suggest today that there are two distortions of seeing that I think we should avoid. One I'm calling hiding shades, right? This represents those times in our lives when we just do not want to acknowledge hard issues. We don't want to look at the news anymore. Uh, And we especially have an inability to see our own inability to see. Sometimes this comes up at business strategy meetings. Somebody will say, well, you know, we don't know what we don't know. Brilliant. I love the story in the Gospel of John, chapter 9, It's a great story of Jesus giving sight to a man who was born blind. And his healing then is investigated by a team of experts. And they can only see how Jesus, the only thing they can see is how Jesus is a threat to them and their order of life. Jesus, in the end, confronts them, the experts, by saying, you know, in your claim to see your guilt remains. Sometimes our overconfident claim to see only what we want to see is really an inability to see. The other distorted lens we can use but should avoid is a magnifying glass of only looking at one aspect or facet of a much bigger complicated concern. Sometimes we Christians can miss the complexity of bigger dynamics or a struggle of what someone else is going through. Jesus once in his teaching asked, why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye, but you pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? Remove your plank first in order to see clearly. Are we able to see the bigger picture when we complain or criticize or judge and fail to see our own problem of plankopia? Paul is giving us two better, clearer lenses today that are vision correcting for us. They're clear and helpful because both of Paul's lenses are framed, get it, framed in Jesus. Uh, We have to remember, it was Jesus who intercepted Paul when he was traveling one day on the Damascus Road. Jesus stops Paul with a blinding light. And that's because he had been acting out in pharisaical blind rage against Christians. He was persecuting them. And so Jesus stops him in his tracks, speaks to him, and prevented Paul from seeing so that later his sight could be restored in a whole new heavenly way. I think it's because of that that Paul wants to teach us about two new ways of seeing, two lenses or outlooks of life renewal. And and both of these lenses in our scripture are introduced with the word therefore. I've told you this many times, I'm going to say it again. Bible readers, When you're reading scripture and you encounter the word therefore, always stop and ask what it's there for. It's a key word. And so the first lens of clear vision is this. You are becoming new in Jesus Christ. It's an astounding thought. And it's a Bible promise. When you entrust your life 
to Jesus, you are responding to what the Spirit of God has sparked in you to make you new, to give you a new identity. Paul says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone. The new is here. When you place your faith in Jesus, friends, you're beginning a new identity journey in Jesus. But we can struggle with this. I, I like how the J.B. Phillips version puts this. If a man is in Christ, he becomes a new person altogether. The past is finished, gone. Everything has become fresh and new. So Paul is describing a rebirth here. And it's one that promises everlasting salvation, but that new peace begins now as the Holy Spirit is working in you each day. Friends, when you turn your life and trust over to Jesus, you become a new creation in process. There's a rebuilding and restoring that started and ultimately will find fulfillment in a perfect communion and relationship of peace that was started, friends, way back at the beginning of creation. So you, Christian, you are becoming new in Jesus each day. And it's not so much up to you as it is in you and for you. That's the good news. What it takes is that first step of faith to begin walking with Jesus but look what happens. The real work of God in you is through God. Paul says all this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. This is from God. Friends, God radically broke into human history in the incarnation and birth embodiment of his son Jesus who was given to us in this world to reconcile us back to God, to repair the rebellion we each participate in. Elsewhere, Paul would say, we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. And so God is reconciling us back to himself in Jesus, but he's also giving us a purpose in life, a purpose of reconciliation with others. And the core of this is that it is through Christ. In verse 19, Paul repeats and stresses this thought. You should see yourself as being reconciled to God in Jesus, but also reconciling others with others. And this leads us to the second lens of Paul's vision correction. The second is, every day you live as an ambassador of Christ. This is the second lens of seeing ourselves and our role in this world. And it's a remarkable way of seeing. Paul says we are therefore Christ ambassadors. As though God were making his appeal through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf be reconciled to God. Being reconciled to God is one of the biggest orders of life and our concern. It's that sense that now through Jesus, we can address God and know we're good. Sometimes we'll say that to each other. Okay, are we good? Right. That's what it means. And it's that goodness of, of rest, relationship restoration that can be offered through us to others. Um, in the message, it says, we are Christ's representatives. God uses us to persuade men and women to drop their differences and enter into God's work of making things right between them. We're speaking for Christ himself now. Be, become friends with God. He's already a friend with you. So how's your outlook? Do you see yourself as Jesus' representative? Do you see yourself as a reconciled friend with God? You know, I can tell you when you're a pastor, people uh, joke about how you work for God. 
And, it, and, and usually it's pretty amusing. Uh, I've, numerous times I've had people say to me, well, you know, Andy, uh, you work for him. Uh, can you do something about the drought? Can you make it rain? And usually I say, well, you know, I'm in sales, not management. But you and I both, friends, you and I both work for God. We are representatives of Jesus. Where you work, where you leisure, where you rest in your home. Um, and I want us to think about what that means. Living as an ambassador of Jesus, it means you are a life offerer in a strange land. And it changes your outlook. The first piece we should know is, as an ambassador of Jesus, you live under authorization. This means you and I every day are under assignment. We've got special orders for why we are here, why we're alive, and how we can offer life renewal to others. Jesus' last words in the Gospel of Matthew state this clearly. Jesus said, all authority in heaven and on earth have been given to me. Now go. It's an imperative. Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. We're under orders. It wasn't Jesus' idea. It wasn't Jesus' suggestion. No. Jesus says go. But he also promised to be with us as we carry out his mission. Paul says Christ's love compels us because we are convinced that one died for all. And that word compelled means gripped by love. Suneco. It means to hold something together in a way that will never let it fall apart. Paul says we are compelled. The Spirit of Christ has his unfailing grip on us so that we might grab hold of others and offer life. Secondly, as an ambassador, friends, you are a citizen representative of another world, God's kingdom. You know, some of you know that I came from a strange and exotic land that, uh, that is usually called Ohio. And I can tell you, growing up there, Ohio is a land of beautiful people. Beautiful trees, buckeyes, beautiful, constant, overcast clouds. In Ohio, there are this, these... Uh, food things called jello molds, which in Ohio we call salads. In Ohio, there's this vastly superior form of mayonnaise that is rightfully called Miracle Whip. Yes. And in Ohio, you find what's called the heartland of this country. But I'll tell you today, quite seriously, if you want to discover the real heartland of our best home, you need to open yourself to the Spirit of Jesus Christ and share that. And so as an ambassador of Christ, friends, we all must realize we don't completely, ultimately belong here. There's that old gospel song, This world is not my home, I'm just a passing through. My treasures are laid up. Exactly. That, that's a sense of this current life, which many of us can struggle over. This is not our ultimate main gig. This world and its headlines are not our only canvas to live and paint on. Your, our real home is a land of promise and peace that is guaranteed for us in Jesus, and that shapes how we live here. Paul says we live as kingdom representatives as though God were making his appeal through us. You, so, you know, I could say I'm a representative of Ohio because I'm from there. I grew up there. I love there. But I'd rather tell you about my best home, my future home, which is promised to me and my Savior. When you enjoin your trust, into Jesus, you become a citizen representative of God's kingdom of hope for others. So you're under authorization. Secondly, 
You're a representative of God's kingdom. Thirdly, you begin to offer refuge and asylum in how you live. I've heard that if you're a stranger in a strange land and you run into trouble, you're told that one idea is to go to your home embassy for help, like if you lose your passport or something. Well, friends, I want to encourage you. Welcome to God's embassy here on the corner of Fort Lowell and Tucson Boulevard. People come here and are able to find others who will pray with them. People come here and discover the Spirit's inspiration and worship. People can come here and receive food and clothing and help. People can come here and realize they're not alone. And people have come here not just from around the city, but from faraway places like the Middle East, Africa. Our prayer is that people will come here and find Jesus. And that's because we are the body of Jesus as we speak of Christ's hope and offer his message of reconciliation. This is why Paul stresses, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. Fourthly, lastly, as an ambassador of Jesus, we are chosen and blessed with spiritual giftedness. You know, ambassadors are known and chosen for their tact, for their diplomacy, for their ability to be courteous and helpful. And friends, God has promised the Holy Spirit to bless and equip us very uniquely, each of us, to do those roles. First off, that means we are never to bludgeon someone with the gospel. No. I like the story of the man who one night got onto a city bus and he was more than a little intoxicated. And he stumbled down the aisle and sat down next to an elderly woman who was clutching her Bible. She looked him up one side and down the other. And turning to her, he asked with quite scented breath, Do you have any idea where this is going? She looked at him and declared, Well, I've got news for you, mister. You're going straight to hell. With that, the man jumped up and said, Oh, no, I'm on the wrong bus again. I'm not supposed to be traveling with you. Ooh. We shouldn't bludgeon people with the gospel, but we also should not keep it a secret either. Every day when we wake up, we should hoist the flag of Jesus Christ in our speech, in our actions, and even within our attitude and emotions. Paul says, from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. In Jesus Christ, we need to put away labels and see each person as someone for whom Jesus died and rose again to offer healing and life. How do we need to do a vision check? Do you have your vision checked? And, and can I ask you, charge you, to check and clear your vision every day. I have to tell you, every day, every day, I have to put on either contacts or glasses because I can't function without them. Without my glasses or lenses, I'd be walking into walls, friends. And every day, Christians, we have to remember who we are in Jesus Christ and who we can be for those around us. Paul said, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us. You see that note? Made him to be sin. That could also be translated as to be a sin offering for us. So that in Jesus Christ, we might become the righteousness of God. Jesus was given as an offering of God's heart for you to be of help for you, to bring you life. How do you every day need to put on the new lenses of seeing rightly in Jesus? Can we take off those hiding shades that refuse to look at injustices, issues, challenges? And can we be careful with magnifying glasses that only focus on one facet or another and not see, try to see a bigger picture. You know, this last week, 
has just been tumultuous. It's been a week of extreme emotions all over the map. I would say these last three years have been tumultuous for all that we have faced and struggled through together. Can we, with all that's going on in life, can we commit to showing and acting with the graciousness and gentleness of Jesus as we speak and talk with one another within church, in the community? For there are so many different ways of seeing what goes on in life. Can we claim the love of our Savior, the sacredness of life, the precious freedoms and liberties as we care for ourselves and those who are in crisis in our community? Can we be a church that responds with grace, gentleness, and faithfulness to God's Word? Years ago, a friend of mine, a Presbyterian pastor, once told of a friend of his who was a Presbyterian pastor who went on an extensive tour through India. And the pastor was struck in India with the caste system of social ordering and labels and identities that are there, uh, some of which on the very lowest of caste, the untouchables, only hope to escape for hope by somehow dying and reincarnation at one point, Gary, the pastor, walked through a village known to be one of untouchables, the lowest class. And he said it was all he could do to keep walking because of the stench of the open sewage in that neighborhood, the extreme poverty around him. But then suddenly he turned a corner and walked into another untouchable neighborhood in which most of the people were Christian. And he couldn't believe it. He says there were flowers, beautiful flowers everywhere. And so finally, Gary had to ask one man who lived there, tell me, he says, why do you have all these flowers? And the man asked, he says, well, do you know Jesus? And Gary, the pastor, smiled and said, yes. Then the man smiled back and he says, well, then you know why we have flowers. It's the beauty of an art of hope, life. Friends, can you and I see the beauty and grace of Jesus even in challenging times, and especially for those who are hurting, angry, distressed? You know, God spoke through his prophet Isaiah. God said, see, I am doing a new thing. And in the book of Revelation, Chapter 21, we hear that repeated at the end of the Bible. See, I am making everything new. Can you and I see? Dear God, help me, help each of us to see, to see life through you, Jesus, to see your word and truth, to see how to live in a complicated and broken world. Jesus, can you come and correct, clean up, clear up our way of seeing so that we can be of help to those around us, so that we can speak your name, Jesus, and show your peace by how we live? Help us as your church, Jesus, to see and to act as your new creation, as your ambassadors, Jesus. For it's in your name and for your sake that we pray. Amen.